Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 20th meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I remind everyone, please, to make sure their phones are on silent. We have received apologies this morning from Gail Ross and Rhoda Grant. The first item on the agenda is, to con is for the committee... Sorry, the committee has asked to consider its approach to the scrutiny of the Island Scotland Bill, which is at agenda item three. And uh, it, the question is, is the committee happy to take this in private? Yes. yes. So we're all agreed. So moving straight on to agenda item two, we're going to receive an update from ScotRail Alliance and Network Rail on rail services and the rail network in Scotland. Today I'd like to welcome Mark Kahn, the Chief Executive of Network Rail, Alec Hines, the new Managing Director of Scott Rail Alliance, and David Dixon, the Infrastructure Director of Scott Rail Alliance. The committee last heard from Scott Rail Alliance on the 18th of January, where Mr. Hines' predecessor, Phil Verster, updated the committee on a number of rail projects uh, and improvements. I would like to invite Mike Khan and then uh, Alex Hines to make a short opening statement. So, Mark, if you'd like to lead off. Uh, well, thank you, uh, convener, and good morning, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure for me as Chief Executive of Network Rail to have an opportunity to be here uh, with the committee um, because I think I come here for three main reasons. Firstly, to talk about the Scott Rail Alliance, my observations on this uh, groundbreaking partnership two years in um, to, the, to the partnership, to be here and to introduce Alex Hines, the new Alliance uh, Managing Director who joined us less than two weeks ago, um, to continue the excellent work that uh, Phil Versiter led, uh, forming the Alliance and helping in its uh, initial creation. But also to talk to you about the exciting plans for upgrading Scotland's railway, adding 20% more capacity to the railway, 100,000 more seats in the next uh, couple of years, uh, really transforming uh, Scotland's railways for um, our passengers. Is I fundamentally believe that railways are best run when track and train work closely together with alignment of objectives, alignment of incentives based on delighting passengers. That's why within Network Rail we have driven devolution to local businesses that in turn work as closely as possible with train operators. That is why I've devolved decision-making for Scotland's Railway to the team based here uh, in Scotland. Now, this devolution within uh, Network Rail is leading to different forms of alliance, uh, formal and informal, uh, in different parts of the country. And that's driving innovation and faster decision-making. But here in Scotland, the uh, Scott Rail Alliance is more ambitious and more integrated than anywhere else in the country. Nowhere, nowhere else in the country has one person like Alex who is personally accountable for the total performance of the whole railway. It's of course helped by um, the fact that in Scotland we have a separate regulatory settlement for the railway infrastructure and its own funding. Operational targets for the railway are set uh, and all investment priorities are set by Scottish Government. So given that, I am in no doubt that we are accountable to the Scottish people for the success of their railway. And Alex, da David and I uh, being here today is an important part of this accountability. I firmly believe that the ScotRail Alliance is the right model for Scotland. It is allowing us to deliver one of the biggest upgrades of the railway since Victorian times and delivering improving performance every single day on a railway that has never been so busy. I can tell you that there is huge interest in the rest of Britain in the Alliance here in Scotland, with every part of the country keen to learn from what is happening here. I think Scotland is currently leading the way in how we can improve collaboration and focus on passengers. I mentioned that we are delivering the biggest railway upgrade for generations. Now, Network Rail has a fine track record of project delivery in Scotland over the last 10 years, improving your railways and building new railways, reconnecting communities to each other and to jobs, housing 
and thus economic growth. The new Borders Railway was delivered on time and within budget, and we've had other notable successes with Airdrie Bathgate, the Glasgow to Kilmarnock route upgrade, Paisley Corridor route, route upgrade, Paisley Canal electrification, and many others. These projects really matter. These upgrades, uh, the upgrades that we are now delivering, and the new trains that they will enable, will mean an increase of 100,000 seats every weekday by 2019. It's a transformation of the railway. But one particularly challenging project has been, and still is, the massive Edinburgh-Glasgow uh, Improvement Project, or Egypt. As you know, this is far more than just an electrification program, but a comprehensive route upgrade. And whilst there have been a number of really significant successes within this project, including the uh, groundbreaking work on uh, Queen Street Tunnel and Winchborough Tunnel, uh, we've also faced some significant challenges. But I can assure you that the team based here in Scotland are working absolutely flat out. And as we sit here today, I can confirm to you that uh, what the Minister said in his letter to you yesterday is that we are on track to deliver what really matters to passengers, which is a railway that's able to improve, deliver the improved uh, December 2017 timetable with full electrification and the introduction of the exciting new longer class 385 trains. Now, the railway is a highly complicated engineering marvel with an extraordinarily proud history. And as engineers, railway people can get absorbed in the technical detail. We love it. But I always remember that we exist for one reason, to improve the quality of life of the people who depend on us because better railways drive economic growth, create jobs, housing, and opportunities. Last year, we enabled 96 million customer journeys, the highest number ever, and we're set to increase that to 125 million by 2025. The railways are the economic arteries of Scotland's economy, bringing people closer to new opportunities across the country. And we never forget who we are ultimately accountable to. Thank you. Thank you. Alex, would you like to yes, of make course. a statement? Well, good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to introduce myself to the committee as the new managing director of the Scott Rail Alliance. As Mark says, a unique and industry-leading partnership between Abellio, Scott Rail and Network Rail Scotland. After nearly 20 years in the UK rail industry, the opportunity to lead this Scottish focused alliance at such an exciting time is one which I couldn't resist. Um, obviously for me it's only day 10 uh, but I am of course committed to continuing the practice of regularly appearing in front of the committee to update you on progress and addressing any issues of the moment. As well as being a daily ScotRail commuter I have been lucky enough to undertake lots of mystery shopping in advance of my start and I've seen much but not all of our great network. Scotland's railway is already something we are all rightly proud of and it is a great credit to the people who work so hard to make it so. But we know it can be and will be better. So my first priority is to review the performance of the Alliance. What is working? What isn't working? What needs to change with the overriding objective of delivering for the customers of Scotland's railway? The fare paying passenger, the taxpayer, train operating companies, and of course, freight operating companies and their customers. We know that 2016 was sometimes a difficult year. So continuing to improve performance and restoring customers' trust in our service is a key and urgent task. Operating a safe, environmentally friendly, punctual and efficient service which delights customers through great people is business as usual for all railway companies. But we are also delivering the Scottish Government's vision for a multi-billion pound investment programme for Scotland's railway. Upgrading old infrastructure often overnight whilst also delivering the essential daily service to customers is not always an easy or elegant task, but it will be worth it. Our objective is a simple one. We are going to give Scotland the best railway it has ever had. 
We are going to deliver faster journeys. We are going to deliver brand new trains. We are going to deliver more seats and we are going to deliver more services. We are going to recreate a proper high-speed intercity network within Scotland, which connects the seven great cities of our country. We will deliver fantastic stations, smart ticketing, and outstanding customer service, helping to drive the prosperity and quality of life for those of us who choose to live and work in Scotland. And we'll provide improved services for tourists who visit Scotland too. It's a big mission, it's a vitally important one, and I look forward to working with you to deliver it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now going to drill down, I think, down into some of the, 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 the areas which uh, are concerning the committee. And Stuart's going to start us off. Uh, thank you very much. And I start with my usual declarations, uh, convener. Uh, I'm the honorary president of the Scottish Association of Public Transport and one of a large number of honorary vice presidents of uh, Rail Future UK. Uh, so um, I'm not, I have no executive position in either of these bodies, nonetheless. Uh, but I do get consulted about some of the things that they say. Um, I've just had a look at the numbers. Uh, two minutes ago, the PPM for Scotland is 95%. Um, it's actually a pretty good day in the GB network, I think it's fair to say. And uh, we've seen significant improvements in the PPM in Scotland, but the annual figure is still carrying the overhang of a period of pretty poor uh, performance. Now, uh, Mr. Khan, you specifically uh, said that you've a fine track record of delivery over the last 10 years. I think we might take the view it's a wee bit more patchy than that. The Stirling Alawick and Cardinal line uh, came in more than twice the budget. Uh, on the other hand, the small project of Paisley Canal came in under half of the original budget. So there's good news and there's bad news. But today's news about Egypt, and you've confirmed we're going to be ready in December 2017, but I think you would acknowledge that it's now very tight with no margin uh, for further problems. I want, before I've completed the set of questions I want to ask, to understand what is technically been causing the problems on Egypt. And perhaps you'd like to, in obviously layman's terms, uh, explain that. Although I will say I'm a member of the MIE team, so you can be a wee bit technical. But not too technical for me. <laughs> so do, do you want to lead off with that, Mark, or Alex, do you want to start that? I, I think David will be able to, well, to David furnish the committee with uh, the details, but I mean, let me just start off at, a, at, a, at the higher level. I mean, I think we do have a, a strong track record of delivery. Um, a, a lot has changed in the way that the Network Rail is structured and, form, and formed as, an, a, as a body over the last few years with the reclassification, and that has had a profound impact on not just Network Rail, but the whole regulatory structure and funding structure within the country as a whole. And, you know, the first couple of years of this control period, particularly in England and Wales, were very traumatic, in, and we had some major uh, problems with bigger it, projects. It's, it's worth my while coming in, of course, we're keeping an eye on what's happening on the Great Western Railway. Yes, no, indeed. The, the vital interest we have in getting the rolling stock off there uh, to augment our <laughs> railway. Well, uh, so, uh, but I, so I, my point really was that the first two years of this control period were very, very challenging as we readjusted to the new set of circumstances uh, as a reclassified body with no increase in debt limit and so on. But um, after we reset, the, particularly the Great Western program, for example, um, I'm proud to say that we've hit every single milestone. And yesterday I was very proud to be in Paddington when the first IEP train came into Paddington with Her Majesty the Queen on board and saw the refurbished Paddington and station. So we are delivering now across the board uh, and with, a, with an improving track record. But projects do face challenges. That's what we are here to do, to recognize those challenges and to address them. Uh, I'm not happy with the way the Egypt project has run, the electrification part of it, and we've been drilling into it in some depth to, um, to turn it around and to improve it. Uh, and I'm, enc I'm encouraged by the progress that the team here are making in Scotland to, to turn that around. Uh, David, I'm sure you can give uh, examples of the kinds of things that are now happening that give us the confidence that well, we will hit the December date. Can I first hear about what the current problem is? Yeah. 
Yeah, well, since, since the committee last um, sat and we were there, um, the date has gone back since then. There's a number of issues that we've uh, experienced in that time. Um, we, you, you will be aware that there's been issues around a particular component which uh, has caused problems. Uh, What's the, the component? I don't think we know. It's, it's a connector for the electrical uh, wires which effectively attaches it to the structure. Um, and what we were experiencing was they'd been installed for quite some time, they were beginning to slip, so effectively failing. And this introduces a potentially the most significant part is a safety risk, and of course that's of, of great but, concern but, to us. What, 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 do forgive me, why is this happening? Because I understand it's not a new piece of kit, it's kit that's used elsewhere in the network, so why and what is causing it to happen here? We, who, who carries the can for this? It, well, this actual bit of kit um, that we're talking about specifically here, um, as far as we understand, is only actually on Egypt. Um, so it hasn't been used elsewhere, ah, this right. particular uh, piece of equipment. Um, so that's, that's that. It's actually under investigation just now. So as to the exact cause, there's a number of components have gone off to be independently tested. And we'll await what the outcome of that is. The important thing was that we didn't want to wait in terms of waiting for some outcome from that independent testing. So the decision was made, look, we just need to go on and change these out. And that's what we're doing. So, there's about so how many of them are there? There's about 300 of these components, which we have just now built into the programme going forward, that we will just take out. We couldn't wait for... for and how long does it take to replace each one? Um, they can certainly a team a, a team can do that in a shift. Um, of course, that doesn't sound um, like an awful lot. The, the difficulty with working on night shifts and the amount of work that's going on is, in some areas, you're down to perhaps an hour's access to do work, actual work. Are there 300 the shift. shifts between now and October? Yes, because uh, part of what we've done, and it, it does go back to you know what were some of the issues. Um, we, we were running around with about 43 um, gangs working, mm -hmm. typically overnight, uh, across the Edinburgh Glasgow uh, upgrade. We've, we've upped that number of gangs now to about 53. Um, and that's giving some account for, you, you know, there will be leave, there will be reasons why some gangs can't go out. So we'll average just under 50 gangs out of, a, of an evening. And what we've done is we've built the replacement into the ongoing works rather than a specific programme just to go out and change these first. Right. But, but, but let me go back. I said, how long does it take? And you said, you can do one a shift. Is that one per gang per shift? Or yes. is it? Uh -huh. so, so it's 53 a shift? No, because it depends where people are working. And, and to be efficient in terms of changing them out, we wanted to build it in amongst the remaining work rather than do a specific program of just changing it out, which actually would be inefficient for us in terms of trying to build So what does the, the one per shift mean? It means that we'll, we'll, we will, to this point, in the last couple of weeks, we've changed out. To give you an idea of that, we've changed out about 90 out of the 300. So that's 90 in three weeks, did you say, sorry? In less than two weeks. In less than two weeks. So is that a reasonable template for how it might yeah, be that you yes. replace the remaining 210? Uh -huh. Because they're not universal throughout. There's different types of connectors throughout it, so it depends where they are. So it's not a failure program. of a single type of connector? Yes, it is. Um, but there, there's more than one type of connector uh, on the ENG, so... They are actually built into the programme. We don't have any concern in terms of actually getting Sorry, this completed just, within just the Just to be program. clear, you said there's more than one type, but it's the same. Which is it? There's, there's more than one type of connector on the entire uh, Edinburgh right. to Glasgow. We're only changing out this one type. Right. Uh, and that's built into the programme. It's, it's, it, from that point of view of our productivity of changing these out, we're not concerned because it's built within the broader programme of remaining works. OK, who's going to pay? Well, that's, that's uh, subject to what we actually find as to the cause. At this point, we're not entirely sure what the cause is. It could be installation. It could be the component. It could be issues with the wire. And that's why it's really important that we do understand from the testing what the issue actually is. However, as I say, we weren't waiting for that outcome. It just the important thing was, let's just go on with it. Where does the out. risk stop? In other words, does that risk get transferred into the Scottish Government's budget? Or is that one you're going to carry in Network Rail OK, you're going to have arguments with your suppliers and contractors, I understand that. Where, where, where does the money walk, firewall come in? 
Well, it, it will depend on, on what the outcome is. It could end up a, an insurance So, so depend, depending on what you find in this engineering problem, it could or could not be the government picking up the tap. Why is that? Uh, it would depend on what the, the nature of how it came out and just whether we end up having to pay um, to, to renew these components or not. So but at this, at this stage, it's very hard for me to say so who would be liable. Though, so even though the government had no role whatsoever in specifying this failing component, no role in specifying how that component would be installed, no role in hiring the people who were contracted to do it, you're expecting the government to pay this under some circumstances that you're not today prepared to exclude? Well, ultimately, Network Rail is, is funded by a government. So if we ended up that Network Rail were liable, then ultimately the government would pay for that. But if we find that there's um, other culpability, then it would be dependent upon what that might be, what the outcome But the would ownership be. of Network Rail is UK government, and I'm being quite deliberately parochial. What, why should we pick up the tab for something that's entirely your failing? Or it's, your contractor's failing? It's the funding mechanism under which we operate. Well, Mr Khan, do you think that's a satisfactory way of the funding operating? Uh, well, I, I, clearly the structure of Network Rail uh, is a decision for government, not for, uh, for us. We operate within the decisions, uh, within the framework set by government. What I would say is that... Uh, uh, clearly, we will establish the cause of this failure, and if the risk, if the cause of that failure is uh, uh, the, the result of failures elsewhere, we will ensure that those liabilities are, are, sh are shifted to those other uh, bodies. You know, all, but projects have have uh, a, a range of possible outcomes uh, always, and uh, you know when 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 one enters into a project, and when you are into into a project and and decide to procure a project, you know that there are a range of potential outcomes associated with that project, and that's the risk that you choose to take as funders when you choose to buy a product, a project. You know that you won't get a very precise, you know, a, you know, a precise number. There's a range of outcomes that are possible because there's inevitable risk associated with the project. Our job as the delivery um, agent for you is to try to manage those risks in the best possible way that we can, using all of the skills that are available to us across, um, across the industry, and that's what we're doing. Um, I'm going to move on to other related matters. I'll just make the observation before I do. I spent three years lecturing to postgraduates in project management. So. I'm watching with interest. Um, but on... Before you move on, can I just... I'm, I'm delighted you move on, and, and as long as we stay within Egypt, because there are uh, other, yes. other members that would like to come in on Egypt. So, if, if, please in, continue. In, indeed. I'm quite content if others want to pursue the, well, no, no, the, no, no. the, I mean, the passengers' can, interest, have, 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 which have, I was going on to. Can, continue, yeah. continue on Egypt, yeah. please, and then we'll bring in the others. It, I mean, the bottom line, we, we, we've had... You say, Mr. Khan, that uh, we'll, we'll still be going in December on schedule. Now, of course, that depends on Scott Rail, the other half of the alliance, uh, doing certain things. Uh, perhaps Mr. Haynes, uh, Hines, perhaps yeah. new in post as he may be, uh, can tell us that with this shortened timetable for things yeah. like training and yeah. so on. Yeah, so uh, you only need three things to operate a train service in the timetable, which essentially is our product. That's some track, some trains and some crew. And one of my key priorities between uh, now and the autumn is to make sure that the infrastructure project the new trains project and the, um, the, 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 the manpower planning um, within the train operating company come together to deliver a timetable for customers in December. And it's not just the infrastructure which needs to occur. Uh, the trains are also on the critical path. Actually, we believe that despite uh, delays to the infrastructure, we can compress some of the uh, driver training programmes, which means we can still hit the uh, timetable introdu introduction dates. That is actually one of the benefits of the Alliance, the fact that we've essentially got integrated management. Um, that is something which will receive weekly focus between now and us introducing the electric service with brand new trains. So it's probably my top priority um, in the job. Uh, well, let me just conclude my 
uh, section of questioning by moving to the shots and the Stirling Alloy Dunblane electrification, because until, in particular, the Stirling Alloy Dunblane one is complete, we can't speed up the services between Denver and Glasgow to the extent that we wish to do so. Uh, so it's important for passengers and the overall success of the project. Uh, how are we placed on, on that part of the, the upgrade? So we still intend to deliver some journey time benefit for this December. Yeah. Yeah. The headline figure of 42 minutes between Edinburgh and Glasgow requires the other elements of the electrification to be delivered and to enable us to re-timetable the route and we're working with the project team to make sure that the right elements of SDA, the Stirling and Blaine Allowa programme, are delivered so we can deliver the journey time benefit on Edinburgh Glasgow, which, to, to remind people, is a 42 minute journey time on brand new trains, which are eight cars long. I mean, it's going to transform the customer experience. Mm -hmm. And we're working to deliver that as best we can. So the, the issues that you've had that have been causing difficulty up, in, particularly in the Stirling area, I understand, mm. are now resolved? So the production rates that we're seeing on the Stirling and Blaine Alloway electrification already far exceed those that we've delivered on Egypt. And that's because we've learned the lessons from Egypt and we're already applying them in real time to the next phases of the electrification programme. Thanks, Camilla. Okay, uh, Jamie, you want to come in um, on Thank Egypt, you. I think. Yes, uh, on Egypt specifically, good, good morning, panel. I suspect my questions will be uh, geared uh, towards network rail in this instance. Um, I can keep them quite short and sweet. You may want to take note of them as I go through. Uh, first of all, does uh, network rail have any comment to make on the words of the transport minister who yesterday in the parliament said, and I quote, it is wholly unacceptable that network rail continues to say to me that it is unable to deliver the project despite our having funded, uh, provided the funding as the client. Uh, that's the first point. The second, okay. yep, I, I, shall I do it in that order? Can we, can we deal with that point okay. um, to, to start with? Um, Mark, do you want to, to lead well, on that? I, I, I would agree with the Minister. I think it's most regrettable that we're having these, uh, these challenges and these difficulties in the delivery of this project. Uh, what I would say, however, is that I'm, I'm very pleased that we're in an alliance here in Scotland and that we're working collaboratively and collectively with, um, with our train operating partners to ensure that, as best as we possibly can, we still achieve the benefits for passengers, uh, which is what this project is really all about. So, yes, there are some interim milestones along the way which are moving, and that's regrettable um, because they, they will incur some additional cost and difficulty but uh, we're sticking to our um, guns to, to, to deliver the December the 20, uh, 2017 timetable change. Well, uh, uh, you know, sometimes projects don't always work out as planned and then we take corrective action to make sure that we still deliver the project outcomes, which is, which is what we're doing. So, um, you know, would we want to start from here? No. Are we fixing the problem? Yes. Okay. So, for the benefit of the committee, um, does, uh, given that we have both Network Rail and Scott Rail, Scott Rail Alliance here, could, does anyone know the total cost of Egypt? Because I asked the Transport Minister yesterday and he was unable to tell me. I'd like to think around the table here today we have the expertise that someone could flag up to the committee what on earth the total cost of this project is going to be. Well, I think that uh, clearly the, um, uh, the, the issues that we're facing in the moment um, are going to have uh, a cost implication. And there are other, um, uh, it's a very complicated program with a number of different elements to it, including the Queen Street Station, um, uh, of course, which is a very exciting uh, development. So we are um, constantly reviewing the costs, uh, and some of those costs are commercially uh, in dispute. I mean, so we will have, you know, inevitably have some uh, debate with our um, uh, contracting alliance partners around where those costs should uh, fall. So there's some uncertainty around the, the total co uh, cost in that regard. Um, so I don't want to give a, a, a number today. This wouldn't be appropriate, I think, it, to give us a precise number today. But I think when, um, uh, when we have greater clarity around the, the, the overall programme and the Queen Street programme and so on, then I think it would be entirely appropriate for Alex to, to update the committee on the, the total cost picture. Do you have a ballpark or a range? 
Uh, yeah, but as I said, I think sub because partly because of the commercial uh, complexities here, I think it would be uh, not appropriate to declare it at this point. And on a scale of one to ten, how confident are you that we'll have electric trains on the Glasgow Edinburgh line in October? Well, December, pardon me. Well, we will actually have uh, electric trains in October as well. But the new, the new, um, uh, and we are confident about that. But um, you know. You know, all projects have um, have risk associated with them, and uh, so I, am I 90% confident. I think we're very confident, um, but uh, it's not a cast iron guarantee, and I don't think you'd expect that either, because um, you know events can occur that we will then need to manage. But we have a plan, and I think the good thing I would say is, and I spoke last night, in fact, to the chief executive of the major contractor around this, and. and and, and I was really encouraged about the, the different in a difference in approach that we now have on this project. Because one of the things that I, I think, and I'm sure you find this unacceptable, I certainly find it unacceptable, is that some of the problems that we identified on this project came very late. And, um, uh, at the, you know, at the last minute, really. And, and that suggested that some of our project management controls were not as strong as they needed to be within the alliance. Um, and I was very encouraged last night speaking to the chief executive of uh, the major contractor that uh, our controls are clearly a lot stronger uh, and that we really do understand what it now takes to deliver this. Uh, the improvement in resourcing that we've got is having an impact. So I feel an, an awful lot more confident about this program today than I did a month ago. David, before I bring you in, the, there are actually other questions. I, I noticed you, you wanted to come in. Can I just see if I can bring in John at this stage to, to build on that? Thank you, Kavina. I'll be very brief in the morning panel. It's a question to you, Mr Hines, um, and it's, uh, you, you mentioned training. And clearly there's a pivotal role here for the staff. Now, your predecessor um, had a somewhat combative style with the, the trade unions, in my opinion. Can you assure me that you're fully engaged with the unions? Because they, at the end of the day, are the people who are going to deliver this new service for the public. Yep. So, first of all, I'm absolutely passionate about workforce involvement. I believe if you want to create a great company, you have to involve your staff in the running of it, which is something I did a lot of in my previous role. Uh, clearly, our people have their uh, representatives, and making sure that we're working in partnership with the recognised trade unions is... Uh, also very important. So one of the things that I will be doing is sitting down with the TUs every six months to explain the business plan, what we're doing, why we're doing it. I've already spoken to one of the full-time officers and I've got meetings in the diary with the full-time officers of all four trade unions. So absolutely working in partnership around this change and around this improvement is critical because it's our frontline workforce, the drivers, the guards, the maintainers, the station staff, who are the face of our railway. They're delivering the daily service to customers. It's important they feel uh, listened to, engaged, that we act on their feedback. It's something I'm absolutely passionate about. Thank you. That's very reassuring. Thank um, you. Kate. Mike wants to come. The question that Jamie Green posed about the funding of this project uh, and Humza Yusuf, the Transport Minister, said in answer to Jamie's question in the Chamber that we have a funding ceiling within which we must work. And I do not expect it to be breached. That's yes. what he said. My question is, if we do not know what the funding ceiling is, he, the Minister does not expect it to be breached. Now, I understand, you know, commercial confidentiality. and yeah. the, I understand that. If it is breached, I mean... He said in answer to, his, to Jamie's question that the responsibility for the delivery of the project is network rails and it's the Scottish Government that's the client and the funder. So, if it's breached, who pays it? Is it just going back to the Scottish taxpayer to say we need some more money? Maybe I can make a contrast here between what's happened in England and Wales and what's happening here in Scotland because they're actually very different circumstances okay. and mm. here in Scotland I'm pleased to say that we're in a much healthier position. So when we have uh, commit to deliver a portfolio of projects over the five-year period, a funding envelope is um, provided mm -hmm. by uh, the government to deliver that portfolio of projects. And what the minister was saying was that despite the challenges that we have with this project, overall we will still be within that funding limit. Right. Okay. So, and we have a, a buffer 
mm -hmm. if you like, which um, uh, allows us to manage that portfolio in an appropriate way. Th that contrasts very starkly to the situation that we found ourselves in England and Wales, where um, the, the, the scale of the ambition in the portfolio and the immaturity of the, uh, the scope and definition and uh, specification of those projects meant that as they matured, the costs became much, much higher and it was significantly more than the loan agreement ceiling. And what then that led to was a decision by, uh, fund, by firstly by government not to provide more funds so the, the, the UK government said there are no more funds available, therefore we, we, you have to, um, we have to make decisions, or the government had mm -hmm. to make decisions about which programmes to prioritise to live within the means that were available. So that led to the very high profile decisions around uh, some of the um, um, uh, shifting of, of programmes out of this control period uh, of a couple of years ago. Since then, I'm pleased to say that we are living within that, uh, the, the loan limit uh, in uh, England and Wales as well. But it's a, it is a constant challenge. It's much mm -hmm. tougher than here in Scotland because the buffer is, is, much, is smaller mm -hmm. and it's a, a, an, an even bigger programme of, uh, of work. What, what you're saying is that you're confident that in the portfolio that you have got, yeah. you will not need to go back to the Scottish taxpayer Absolutely. For more money. I'm very confident of that, actually, yes. I, I really am. I think we've, um, we've got a really good handle on, this, on the, the, the portfolio projects now. We've, got, we've delivered some really big successes in this control period already. Yes, we've got some difficulties here and there, and, and I'm, you know, we're all cross about why we are in this situation, and we need to address this, and we're going to. But within the overall funding limit, we will, okay. uh, we will live within the overall funding limit. Okay. Um, just before we move off on, on this, I, I, I have a question. When, when we saw Phil Verster uh, and he came into the committee earlier this year, and in fact last year, he indicated there were some problems on, problem, on, on project management where decisions should have been taken earlier and weren't taken yeah. timelessly to allow the project to develop, which held everything up. Mark, you've indicated to us that you feel that the project management is that much more uh, robust. Alex, you, you, you've indicated the same. Can I ask, actually, on the ground, are, are we actually feeling that the contractors know what they're doing? They can get instant responses? Because if we're not in that position, they're going to come back to you, presumably Mark, and say, well, you failed to make that decision on time and therefore we want more money. Maybe, David, that's an area that you'd like to just clarify. Yeah. I think it, <coughs> we talked earlier about lessons being learned. I think the point, point was raised, and I think... Um, the difference even between Egypt and, for instance, SDA in terms of that, the, the difference in terms of how that's managed, how it's monitored, um, decision making, the actual, the overall governance of all the enhancement programme has, has moved on significantly as well. So we now, since, since the EY rep report, we now have a different structure in place as well. So you have a kind of project level um, which it would be ENG, uh, Egypt, electrification, SDA, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which then builds up into kind of program boards. So you have an electrification um, program board and, and the Highland uh, enhancements, and then that feeds up to a, a, an overall portfolio. So there's there's far more governance, there's far more clarity, and that runs right through with the funder. So TS are involved in, in all of these forums as well. So the clarity that runs through everything is much greater than it was previously, right up, right up through contractors to, to Network Rail and Scott Rail, through to um, TS as funder. But at a project level, there's far better um, control in terms of systems, how we're operating. There's a maturity now in having set up alliances, etc. Some of the systems, we had too many systems running around, so we didn't have clarity across everything that was being uh, monitored and delivered. Um, on SDA, Network Rail have taken complete control of that, so they have single reporting, single tracking, all these sorts of things that we suffered a bit from, regrettably, um, earlier on in terms of the Egypt programme. A lot of these things have been fixed, so there's far greater clarity that allows people to make the decisions that they need to do at an earlier stage to make sure we're more flexible in, in addressing issues. So there's been a lot of stuff has been learned from some of the mistakes that we've made uh, earlier on the Egypt project and taken forward to the benefit of others. And if you actually look at then the programme going forward, you actually find, you know, we do have, we are working to programme in SDA, we are working to programme in shots, etc. So a lot of the lessons are being learned, but as an outcome, 
we are now seeing we are delivering to programme. So just, just so I understand, it, it appears that the project governance to start with on, on these projects were, was poor with, with it was, Scott it, it wasn't good enough in terms so of... So how, as a percentage of the overrun in time and, and, and cost, would you put, down, put that down to project governance at the start of the project? Just a ballpark figure. It's a, it's, that's hard to put a number to. But, um, but would you say that it... it, it it was a good proportion? It's a proportion because of what it feeds into. If you don't have enough visibility, you can't take the actions to okay. address things. So at a high level, for instance, on, on Edinburgh Glasgow, things would look OK. Certain delivery rates were fine. What you couldn't identify was that, you know, a lot of the, maybe the easier stuff was being knocked off that would keep rates up, but you couldn't actually see below what you know, the, the, the kind of better detail to realise actually, in terms of production, we were behind where we needed to be. And so the decisions weren't made then to address that. So you can see now we're at higher levels of gangs, et cetera, than we used to be. And we didn't have that visibility early enough to, to, to see that we were dropping back. Okay. So it's hard to say specifically, you know, but a good proportion. but a good proportion. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is Richard. Yeah. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, there were two reviews published on 25th of November 2015, uh, particularly asking questions in regard to the Bury review. Um, Dame Collette argued that the government needed to clarify the organisational responsibility of the Department of Transport, Network Rail and the Office of Rail and Road, ensure significant more robust programme governance, incorporate the views and needs of end users, put much more focus on deliverability, including the implications through, for the supply cha chain. So what, if any, impact have the recommendations of the Bay report had on network rail operations in Scotland. That sounds like you, Mark. No, well, absolutely. And I think the Bow review was a really important review because when we were reclassified as a government body and the whole funding mechanism of network rail changed, in a sense, the industry was, if you like, caught out with a huge portfolio of pro mainly in England and Wales. I mean, the Bow review concentrated on England and Wales, but the lessons apply as much to Scotland as they do to England and Wales. But essentially, the industry was caught out with a huge portfolio that was immature, poorly thought through, because we relied as an industry on a regulatory structure that allowed Network Rail to manage that risk by borrowing more money off government balance sheet. Once that uh, avenue of risk management was closed off, suddenly, if you like, all of those projects were exposed for the immaturity that they, uh, with the, the, for the immaturity that they had. And what uh, the Bow review basically said was, um, uh, and this is a, you know, it's a lesson that major infrastructure industries learn many, many times, that you need to spend more time up front specifying exactly what it is you need, thinking through the scope, doing the upfront design, then defining what the contracting structure is, making sure you've got the right um, cost estimates and so on. And only at that point in time making the final investment decision to proceed with the project. Um, and I think that uh, it's just, a, I think it's just good practice. It's exactly the way that capital intensive industries ought to operate. So we have fundamentally changed the way we work in network rail and not just within network rail, but with the regulator and with the department. And I believe also here in, uh, in Scotland, so that we put an awful lot more effort into the upfront design and um, uh, um, scope definition before we make promises to, um, to uh, passengers. But I do ask as well the politicians to play their part in this as well, because politicians that um, make, uh, uh, that give indications to the, the traveling public about the cost of projects when, when the projects are very immature in their formulation can raise expectations in a very unfair way, in my view. So I think we've all got to work closer together to understand the risk of um, uh, the uncertainty associated with projects and, and come together and make the, the investment decision at the right moment in time when we are confident about how it can be delivered and when it can be delivered. I would be very surprised if any politician admitted they were immature. Um, but no, the, the, not, not the politicians, the cost <laughs> estimates. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, 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 quite, I'm quite impressed with the word that you're using, uh, immature. So basically the contracts prior to this immature uh, weren't really being thought out. What? No, it's not that. It's um, that if you t if I if may I take some examples. Um, so uh, if you take, um, I can take a number of examples from around the country. But at the beginning of a five-year control, the way it used to work was at the beginning of the five-year control period, funders would say, "I want these projects," and we'd say, "Well, okay, we think that they'll cost roughly this, but we don't know exactly how much." Aberdeen in Venice is a very good case in point. I think the point. first number you thought of, double it or... So, or so you know, at, at the very earliest stages of this control period, we thought it would cost 171 million, I think it was. But it was... There was no, no real definition of, around exactly what that project was going to involve. Yeah. So now we find... Now we've done the work. Now we understand exactly what is required, what was going to be needed on the project. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're in a much better position to give a detailed cost estimate, and it is higher. Um, but I think that's the right way to, to, to approach it. Do the work, then allow funders to make the choice whether they now want to buy that product. If they want to buy it, then we'll deliver it with confidence. And we've got a very, very good track record of delivering once at the cost that we define when, when we've reached that level of definition. So you're no longer immature. When we, when we reach, if you, if you make, if you make projects deliver, uh, if you look at our portfolio as a whole, the cost of the delivering that portfolio as a whole relative to the cost that we estimated at a final investment decision point is about 2%, within 2%. It's very close. But if you, it's a bit like saying to somebody, you know, uh, what's the price? I'd like you to build me a four-bedroom house. What's the price? And you say, oh, oh, Okay. Well, actually, I want it in the centre of, of, of Edinburgh, or I want it in, you know, but, the Highlands. It just, it, you know, the price yeah, changes but, as you define the specification. So don't you can't create a lump sum price until you've done enough work. Yeah, but if we all, and I'll finish on this, because you know, if, if if I want something, I'm I'm getting something done in my house next week. The chap came in, he showed me a plan, he showed me what he's going to do, he gave me a cost. I actually beat him down by a few quid, right? Uh, because I had, a, I had a, a, a figure in my head. So I, I worked for a bank for 10 years. At the end of the day, basically, you negotiate and you decide a price. And you don't pay it until it's delivered. Yep. And when it's delivered, it has to be the quality that you agreed and the specification, da di da di da Exactly. So I now know exactly. that you, that's the way you're going down, and thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next question, John. Um, yes, Again, uh, for yourself, Mr. Carney, about a, another review, the Hendy review. Yes. Uh, um, I wonder, could you comment about what the implications of that are for network rail operations in Scotland, please? Um, the Hendy review didn't cover Scotland, uh, so that's the first thing, because, yeah. the, as I alluded to earlier on, the, the major funding uh, problems that we had within uh, network rail occurred in the England and Wales portfolio. Uh, so here in Scotland, uh, we knew that we were within our loan agreement, and so we didn't have to make significant changes to the portfolio here in Scotland. Whereas in England and Wales, we did not have enough money to deliver all the programmes that the government wanted. And so decisions had to be taken about which programmes to shift, and that was a decision taken with, with, with government. However, I mean, uh, just as with the Bow Review... Um, uh, the Hendy review shone a light on many of the project management uh, or many of the uh, project practices within the industry as a whole and we've learned a lot and delivered a lot of improvements. We actually initiated a whole enhancement improvement plan to ensure that we would deliver enhancements better and those lessons have been applied here in Scotland uh, and, I'm, uh, and I'm confident that as an organisation, our ability to deliver these sorts of major, major programmes is better now than it has ever been in the past as a result of those improvements. There's still more to do, 
but we are in a better shape because of it. Okay, can I, can I ask, and this was leading on to, to a, a further question I had there, there was a suggestion that a requirement to sell 1.8 1, 1. billion of non-core assets, this was property, spare capacity in your telecom system and indeed depots, and that went in line with a, a, an increase in your uh, borrowing limit. Does Network Rail have any plans to dispose of assets in Scotland? Um, so that would be something that we would need to agree with the Scottish uh, Government and with the, uh, uh, the regulator, and there are no specific, specific plans that I'm aware of at the moment to, to, to do that. It's a separate conversation that we haven't yet had. Again, the 1.8 billion uh, property <coughs> sales was to help bridge the gap in the England and Wales portfolio. So that was the, the, the focus of our, um, uh, of, our, um, of our efforts. In the very early days, I think we were looking at the, our overall property portfolio, and we probably were considering some asset sales within the Scottish portfolio, but I don't think that is the case now. OK, well, I, I, in connection with the question of disposal of assets, I was going to ask about what the implications of that could be for potentially any future rail enhan enhancements. Uh, uh, and, and indeed, I asked a, a parliamentary question fairly recently about that. Can I ask what liaison Network Rail would have in Scotland regarding that, yeah. um, particularly so with, for instance, local authorities? Because I know we've talked a lot about passengers, but the potential to move goods from road to rail could be inhibited if there isn't the potential to maintain some of the lines and oh, okay. expand well, them. Uh, so, so thank you. That's a really important point, actually. And, and, and I'd like to address it on, on a couple of fronts. Firstly, I mean, clearly, we can't just sell assets that have a long-term potential future in uh, the railway. So there are regulatory constraints, uh, and we have to consult with the industry and consult with the regulator to get the agreement to, to sell those assets. We have to prove, if you like, that there is no long-term uh, alternative use within the railway. Because the last thing I want to do is to sterilize the growth of the railway. Quite the opposite. I want to grow the railway. And indeed, that is actually part of the reason why I wanted to sell some of these assets. Because the assets that I wanted to sell are, um, well, for example, our commercial estate. We have a huge commercial estate of, un, of uh, businesses in the railway arches. These are mostly, of course, now restaurants, coffee shops, um, and, and all sorts of different kinds of tenants that we have within our estate. And, and I wanted to sell that, the, and we are <coughs> going to sell those business, that business, and then reinvest that money in railway projects. So we're reinvesting it in, pr in, in projects that will improve the passenger experience. So far from this strategy um, um, uh, destroying, if you like, the, the capability of the railway, it's actually enhancing the capability of the railway by re recycling funds uh, into, uh, into better investments for the railway. Okay, Re receipts realised as a result of the disposals, is that, do they have a UK-wide implication or is it simply in England and Wales? Um, so the, 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 the major conversations are around England and Wales. It's about uh, how do we address the funding gap within the England and Wales portfolio. And the, and the property sales are focused on the England and Wales portfolio. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, Peter, you wouldn't question next. Yeah, good, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, there seems to be a whole plethora of reviews and reports. We've heard about the Boer Review, the Hendy Report, but there is another. Uh, Transport Scotland commissioned Ernst & Young to under, undertake a, a review which was called the Commercial Assurance Review of the Rail Major Projects Portfolio. Catchy title, if ever heard one. <laughs> and uh, there was, there were, you know, uh, w w much of what they reported we've heard about already. Cost estimates in the development stage have been unreliable, inconsistent governments between Network Rail and Transport Scotland. And one that I was particularly in interested in, it says Transport Scotland lacks commercial leverage to reward or penalise Network Rail to drive performance. That's just one or two of the issues that it highlights. But my particular question is, how does this review and how has this review influenced the delivery of the, of the ongoing Aberdeen, Inverness and Highland uh, mainline projects in, in particular? Alex, you want to go on? Or, or well, David? I mean, the first thing to note is that um, the recommendations from the EY uh, report are being acted upon. And in fact, yesterday I attended the meeting where uh, Network Rail and the Alliance and Transport Scotland to get together to review the portfolio of major rail 
projects and one of the items on the agenda was actually where are we with implementing the recommendations. As I've already said, many of these recommendations have already been implemented and we're generating evidence which shows that they're working. So I have confidence that um, future projects and the rest of the portfolio will go rather better than perhaps Egypt has, which is one reason why we're confident of remaining within our headroom. Mm. Well, I mean, that, that's, that's, you know, that, that there's a comfort, and we, we have drilled down pretty, pretty severely in, into the, the management structure. So, um, so basically you're saying the, the procedures now are sufficiently robust to ensure that decision makers have access to accurate information during the, the, the scoping of the projects and the development and delivery will, uh, will take place, you know, to, to time and to budget. Basically, that's what you're telling us now, that you have that, you have that uh, process that's now in place and you're con confident that going forward we're going to get better at doing what we, we haven't done no. quite so well in the past. Th things have massively improved. In the very yeah. meeting that I was referred to is what I was talking about earlier, that government, governance process. So it's much, much open to all parties. So mm. that visibility and, and ability to, to make decisions is, is much enhanced. I think that's a significant element of what came out of EY. Um, and, and there are further reviews, you know, getting back to that kind of too early in the process. There are other reviews going on just now. The ORR again is kind of looking at the electric, electrification portfolio, acknowledging that it kind of looked at it at too early and undeveloped a stage. So it's looking at that again as well. So there's a, there's a few things that tie in with what was mm. in EY that are progressing quite um, significantly. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to go on to the next question, which is about yet another report. Yes, sir. John. An another review, the Shaw Review, uh, which came up with such stunning uh, comments as uh, the recommendation was to place the needs of passengers and freight shippers at the heart of rail, structure, uh, rail infrastructure management. I have to say, I thought that would have been an assumption. And uh, we should focus on the customer. Well, there's a good idea. Um, so, I understand Network Rail responded uh, to that um, with a transformation plan, is that right? Can you give us any comments as to how in practice that makes any difference in Scotland? Um, well, I, I think the, the, um, the really interesting thing about the Shaw Review, which I think was a very thoughtful and, and detailed review, was that it actually very largely supported the transformation program that Network Rail was on. And as I alluded to in my uh, opening remarks, I, mean, I fundamentally believe that Network Rail has to be closer to customers, and the customers are, are the train operating companies for us, the freight operating companies, and ultimately passengers. That is at the heart of our strategy to devolve power to uh, route-based businesses, um, and that was what Nicholas Shaw very much supported and agreed with. So, um, uh, you know, we now have eight devolved businesses uh, around um, uh, the UK, um, around Britain, and of which Scotland is one of them. And those different businesses are accountable to delivering for the local um, customers. Uh, we have different alliances in different parts of the country. And different uh, businesses are operating in different kinds of ways to suit the needs of those customers. And we're, so we're innovating in different kinds of ways to meet the needs of customers. Whereas Network Rail used to be very much a sort of command and control sort of central organization. And it's not anymore. It's now very much devolved decision-making to um, uh, the route businesses so that they can work closer with train operating companies and so they can deliver for passengers. And a really profound, you know, there's some really important changes that have occurred in the last couple of years. So, for example, the targets, the, the train performance targets that Network Rail operates to used to be uh, set by the regulator. Now they're actually agreed with the train operating companies, so our customers. And what that does is it means that the train operating company and network rail are all pulling in the same direction to achieve the same outcomes. Uh, and those outcomes are based on what passengers tell us they really want. So we are bringing track and train much closer together to deliver a better service for customers. And I'm, re I'm excited about what we're doing here in Scotland because, as I said, We've gone further here in Scotland than anywhere else by actually having that track and train uh, sort of man, uh, mantra brought together under the leadership of one, uh, of one person. I mean, I accept we've gone further and you've said before that uh, you see Scotland as an example. In fact, I think in the transformation plan, it, it, it gives ScotRail as a case study as yeah, an example. Absolutely. 
and, and specifically on Egypt, that it has, quote, has resulted in reduced costs and helped us achieve key milestones, unquote. I mean, was it a little bit unwise to put that in as an example? Uh, with the benefit of hindsight, probably, yes, I would agree with you. OK. Um, um, uh, well, I think we've given that fair co coverage, so we'll not go on, on on that one. And my final point on this section would be, I mean, there was, I think, suggestions in the Shaw report about uh, somehow bringing in more private finance yep. or uh, other concessions and local sources of funding and financing, that, that kind of area. Well, so let me talk to you a little bit about what we're, what, what we're doing in Network Rail, because Network Rail's sort of strategy is based on, on three really critical ingredients. Firstly, it's about customers. I want the organisation to deeply behave like, if you like, a private sector business, passionate about delivering for customers. Uh, so we, and we've talked about that. That's about devolution and alignment of objectives with train operating companies. The second thing is that if you're a private sector company, you care massively about cost competitiveness. You're constantly saying, how can you be more cost competitive to deliver a better uh, and, and a lower cost service? And as a natural monopoly, we have to instill that competitiveness in our company in different kinds of ways. Partly through devolution, I now have eight different businesses. I can compare and contrast the performance of those different businesses. I can look and see what's working in one bit and say, well, why don't you do it the same way? We start to get innovation and creativity. Can I just ask, would you also compare your costs with the Dutch railways or the German railways? I beg your pardon? Would you also compare your costs with the Dutch or the German railways? Uh, absolutely. Yes. So we also benchmark across the different uh, entities, and, I bench and we benchmark uh, with, um, with, with European railways in a number of different areas. And we perform very well compared to European on railways in a number of different areas. We are the safest railway in Europe. We're investing more in our Euro uh, railway than any country in Europe. We are the fastest growing railway in Europe. We have the second lowest subsidy of any railway in Europe. You know, these are remarkable achievements and a, and a testament to the success of Britain's railways that I think we don't often recognize and celebrate enough. But if I may continue, the, you, you raised the point about third party um, funding and finance, and that is the third element of our strategy. You see, I believe that railways drive economic growth. They create jobs, they create business opportunities, housing uh, opportunities for people. And I think it's far better that railways, uh, the improvements to railways are therefore partly funded or even financed by those people who are going to derive economic benefit from the railway. So we're working very closely right across the country to find ways in which third party funding can be provided to the railway by uh, either local um, transport authorities, um, uh, uh, local enterprise partnerships or councils, or indeed uh, private enterprises that benefit from improved railway connectivity. So we've got stations that are now paid for by uh, private uh, companies. We've got rail connections to freight uh, uh, terminals that are paid for by private companies, uh, funded by private companies. And I want more of that, because why should the taxpayer pay for all of these things if, if um, there are pr uh, private enterprises that directly benefit from it? The more contentious issue is private finance, because private finance um, re requires a return on that investment. And, um, uh, the, and that's a more challenging um, uh, set of circumstances, actually, because they want a higher rate of return than um, borrowing from government. So they have to demonstrably show that they can perform at a higher level to justify that higher rate of return. And I think we've seen in, in many places that that is very challenging to achieve, actually. OK, I'll leave that to now. Thanks. Uh, next question is Jamie. Thank you, convener. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to make an apology to Mr. Hines. I didn't congratulate you on your appointment. Welcome Thank to you. your role. I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot of you over the years to come. Um, going back to Network Rail, I mean, given there's a, a, been a series of reports, reviews, there's some ongoing um, uh, reviews uh, taking place at the moment, do you anticipate any structural changes to Network Rail? And I appreciate some of this may be uh, political decisions that are made by the government of the day, but even within the organisation, do you foresee any major structural changes at Network Rail that may affect uh, how it uh, either manages infrastructure projects, delivers them, um, and any implications that may have in Scotland? No, I've made the, the structural changes that I, I wanted to make in, in Network Rail, and I now have an organisational structure that is 
uh, really strong and fit for purpose based on, um, I think, best practice of major infrastructure organisations uh, that I've worked in elsewhere. And I think the, the, the com and I think Scotland gets the best of both worlds now. You know, with the devolved leadership to Scotland, focused on the Scottish priorities, but nevertheless harnessing the purchasing power of a national organisation, the common standards that we can apply across the, the, the network as, as a whole, the lesson learning, uh, the, the, la the lateral learning and benchmarking across different parts of the railway, uh, these all deliver real benefits for the Scottish uh, railway while still allowing decision making to be focused on what you need here in Scotland. So I think the model provides the best of both worlds. And, it's t and performance is turning around. You know, this is a super tanker. You know, it's a huge, huge industry. And when you change strategy, it takes time to start to really see the benefits deliver. You have to be resolute. You have to be determined to see it. You know, and I'm really encouraged to see the, 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 the uh, improvements in performance, not just here in Scotland, but I can point to many other places in the, in the network where those green shoots are uh, really encouraging, actually. Are you going to agree, uh, agree with Mark, or are you going to say something different? No, no, I'm, I'm going to agree with Mark, because for me it's all about devolution and getting on top of the projects. But we quite rightly focus on what's not going to plan, but we must never forget that all the successes we're delivering. You know, Scotland's railway has happier customers than most of the rest of Britain. Scotland's railway performs at a higher level than most of the rest of Britain. That is something which we should be really proud of, and we've got this multi-billion pound improvement programme to make it even better. And I've got absolute confidence that the issues we faced last year are now well behind us, and not only are we going to give Scotland the best railway it's ever had, but it's going to be one of the best in the world. That's the level of our ambition, and it's for us to deliver it. Do you want to come back, Jamie? Yeah, I think that actually leads quite nicely into my next question. Um, we hear often <laughs> uh, in committee and in the Scottish Parliament uh, calls for further devolution of network rail uh, in Scotland, in uh, either partial... Uh, or completely. Um, in fact, again, yesterday the Transport Minister reiterated his view on this, uh, saying that he, uh, uh, to quote him, uh, it is not acceptable that we as the client fund major projects for which Network Rail, which is responsible for delivery, is not accountable to this government or this parliament. And that's uh, something we hear often from the Scottish Transport Minister. I mean, do you have any personal views on, 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 on that? Uh, uh, or indeed, could you illustrate why you you think the current situation is the best model? Uh, well, um, I mean, I give you my, my perspective. Well, firstly, I, I, we're absolutely accountable to the Scottish uh, government, in my view. The Scottish government decides what the priorities are for investment in, uh, in Scotland. The Scottish government decides what the performance targets should be. The Scottish government decides, uh, um, you know, how, how the, what the franchise should be, and, and, and so on and so on. So I, I'm afraid, you know, I, I think we are very accountable to the Scottish uh, government in that sense. Um, uh, you know, but I do think that the organisation of, and I think the organisation of Network Rail now does, as I said, give you the best of both worlds. Uh, uh, it enables us to create something like the Scott Rail Alliance. If I didn't have a devolved organisational structure within Network Rail, we could not create the, the network, uh, the alliance in Scotland. It's because of devolution within Network Rail that we can even have this conversation with uh, with Alex. So, you know, I think that's a, a really important point. But in terms of um, uh, uh, devolution, you know, I also think you need to harness the capacity of a national company for your benefit. And I'm, I'm very struck that, you know, if you take major projects, for example, um, you know, there's enormous benefit in being part of a major project's portfolio and having the real expertise behind delivering major projects that come from being part of a national um, uh, portfolio with real skills and expertise that are applied across that whole portfolio. And, I, and you will, um, and here in Scotland, you'll certainly be very familiar with Lord John, John Brown, the previous chairman uh, and chief executive of BP, who did a big review for government only three or four years ago in the delivery of major projects. And one of the things that he said is that all best practice companies that he 
um, uh, examined. He said, it's very striking that all the organizations I consulted as part of this review have created central projects authorities to manage the portfolio of major projects to a common set of objective standards and processes. And that's what we've done in Network Rail. We manage our project portfolio to a common set of standards, processes, and objectives, whilst ensuring that those projects are defined and are, are then delivered through our devolved organisations. Alex is not catching my eyes, so I'm assuming that he's well, agreeing. I was just going to say that, you know, well, can, can I just, before I give you a chance to come in, John wants to ask a, a, a supplementary to that, so maybe you could tap the two together. Thanks. Uh, well, as someone who supports the, the uh, devolution of network rail and think it should be entirely in charge of the Scottish Government, uh, you used the term national. I presume you meant UK, Mr Carney. Uh, yes. You did. Okay. Uh, I would like to know then, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> make a pardon, what, what the implications for the sleeper and for the rail freight companies are of this, at, at one time referred to as deeper lines, I think, Mr. Vester used to fail. What are the implications for that? Because, of course, it's not all the train operating companies that operate in Scotland that are part of this alliance, and you know, uh, there, there, there must be implications for that. Yeah, there are. So um, our customers are all the train operating companies and the freight operating companies in Scotland. The largest customer of Network Rail in Scotland is ScotRail itself. Um, Abellio ScotRail and Network Rail Scotland are in a, a, a partnership with one another. Um, but one of my jobs is not just to uh, run the alliance, but also to make sure that Network Rail Scotland is delivering for its other customers. Uh, which, by and large, it, it no, because there are regulatory protections in place, which means mm -hmm. that, from timetabling perspective, from the way that we signal trains, the way we uh, grant access to the network, they're all regulated. So, um, all the other train <coughs> operating companies and the freight operating companies in Scotland can sleep easy at night that ScotRail won't get preferential treatment. But what it allows us to do is to work uh, more effectively uh, in a more agile way for ScotRail's customers. So I'll give you an example. Last week we were discussing our plans for the Edinburgh Festival. You know, this is a global cultural event. It's a, it's a biggie for us. We need to get it right. You know, David is part of my team and we're discussing the management of major stations and track and train and timetable as sort of Team Scotland for the benefit of Scotland's railway. Um, that is a really different place from what exists elsewhere. I think it's really good and I think it's really exciting. And my point that I was going to come into um, Jamie's question was, you know, my job and the, 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 the job of my team and I is to focus on delivering for customers within the existing uh, structure. Um, so, you know, I've been in this industry for 20 years and this structure is always under debate and that will always be the case. But we're going to deliver uh, the best railway Scotland's ever had. New trains, faster journeys, more seats, more services. It's going to be transformational for customers and it's really exciting. And that is the focus of me and my team. If, if I can just, just a final one. Yeah, if, to push the point, has there never been a conflict of interest between uh, that alliance? I, I mean, I take, for instance, um, during the closure of the, the Winchborough Tunnel, and who had priority? So maybe Scott, well, well, if you let me finish the question, please, and it's directed to Mr Hines. Uh, who had priority? Was it the Caledonian sleeper, which was running late, or was it a commuter train from Perth? I've got no idea, because I wasn't here. But if, at any point, we think a conflict of interest uh, would arise, we would take that decision outside the alliance. But I would say, um, you know, this is a highly regulated industry, and all users of the railway have strong regulatory protections to make sure that everybody gets treated fairly on the network. If I may, if I, may I think it's a, very, it's a really important point you're raising here, actually, and it's a, uh, because when you, in, in Network Rail as a whole, as we've devolved to eight different businesses, of course the freight community and the national passenger, uh, like Cross Country or the Caledonian Sleeper, are quite rightly saying, well, hang on, how does that work for us? Because we run right across the UK network, Britain's network. So that's why we have within Network Rail um, a function called the system operator, which runs across all of the different uh, routes. 
and the system operator has the sort of role of, of managing the capacity of the network as a whole for long-term investment. How, you, how can you best improve the capacity of the network as a whole? But also, how can we timetable the network as a whole so that we fairly meet the needs of all different uh, um, uh, users of that network? So how can we best meet the needs of freight trains, of directly operated services, of sleeper services, of alliances? And it's very important that that function is outside of the alliance. Because if it were in the alliance, you're quite right, there will be other users who would say, hang on a minute, how can I be sure I'm getting treated fairly? That is why it is outside uh, of and the And is that live decision-making, Mr. Cameron? I beg your pardon? Is that live decision-making? No, it's not. So live decision-making around so uh, which train gets um, uh, moved uh, at a time of perturbation, that is in the hands of the route control teams in a particular route. And honestly, they sit there and they think about how can we do the most good for passengers? I've, sat, I've watched them do it. They, sit, they look at the train services and they say, that train is busier. That's a, main, that's a really busy train full of lots of people. Let's move the freight train out the way and let it through. They're not sitting there thinking about the commercial gaming within, within the industry. They're thinking about passengers and about how do we restore the service in the best interest of passengers. And I think that's where we would all want them to be, actually. Can, can I just take this one step further? Because one, one of the briefings that we, that we got as a committee uh, was from the Office of Rail and Road. Um, and could you just, just because of this timetabling thing, one of the questions that came out there, there seems to be a dispute between Scott Rail and Network Rail over the changes to the timetable due to be introduced in December 2017. Can you explain why this has now reached a stage where the ORR is considering an appeal? I mean, you're, you're saying that it, it works very smoothly, but it doesn't appear to have, have been as smooth as perhaps possible. Well, in, in, in any organisation or organisations, you get tension between the results we're trying Sorry. to deliver. Are we trying to deliver faster journey times at the expense of performance? Are we trying to um, deliver higher performance at the, ex, uh, at the expense of journey time? That's a balance we need to get right and there's trade-offs to be made and, and it just so happens that in this case uh, the train operating company and network rail have uh, not yet agreed and they're using these established industry processes to resolve that dispute but these are organizations you get even within within an organization this tension between you know the sellers and the marketeers who want faster journey times and the uh, production bits of the organisation who want to deliver a really reliable railway. And that's a difficult balance to get right, and it is a trade-off, and we will resolve it. So, so are you saying to the committee that, that it's a perfectly natural process and it will be resolved to the, to, to the benefit of all at, well, at the end of the day? Th there are established industry processes for dealing with okay. exactly this type of thing. Yeah. So, you know, a dispute between a train operating company and <coughs> Network Rail is not some big disaster. It happens regularly and there are, there's, there's custom and practice to deal with the issue and resolve it to the satisfaction of of the railway. Okay, Fulton, you, you've got the next question. <coughs> thanks, Convener, and thanks, uh, panel, for your evidence so far. Um, uh, my questions are mainly for uh, Network Rail. Can you say out the, the key elements of the Network Rail delivery plan as they apply to the Scotland route? And I'll just take my, my second uh, question at the same time. How is Network Rail preparing for the development of its control period six, which I believe is to start in March 2019? a business plan aspect for Scotland, uh, particularly in the light of failures in the previous periodic review? Probably. David uh, well, um, we're going through the process just now. There's, there's two elements. One is um, putting forward what is essentially, again, a, a, a series of developed choices in terms of the enhancement portfolio, and that's been developed um, and is sitting um, with, with Transport Scotland, the Scottish Government, to make a decision on, on uh, what they would like to proceed with. Um, now, the timescales on, on that, we'd expect some statement within um, July in terms of the funds that are available and that kind of high-level output statement. <laughs> so a kind of, a, a kind of high-level decision on, on what Scottish Government would like delivered uh, within control period six. 
So that's, that's one element of it in terms of how do we develop the railway. So that choice is to be made. And until we see that in July, I think it's, it's mid-July uh, ties in across the UK. Until we see that, we won't know exactly um, what the priorities are for Scottish Government. But there's a number of developed choices, as I say, that have been put there. Um, that have been worked up to, to a degree to allow that choice to be made. In, in terms of um, the, the rest of our business plan, our strategic business plan for, for the next control period, um, we're currently going through that. We just, we're, we're going through the review process just now for the remainder of this control period and through um, the remainder of, of uh, or the, the following five years for control period six. And that covers all our operations, maintenance and renewals uh, within Scotland. Uh, again, that will be subject to understanding how much funds are available, and that will go through a process which takes us through to December uh, of this year. Um, and again, we've, we've put together what we believe we need to do to, to properly sustain and develop the railway uh, in Scotland through that following five years. Um, so it will depend on, on, on what funds come through in the process that we go through. But that's the two timelines for, for July for, for that kind of high-level output um, of, of what Scottish Government would like to see in, in, in CP6, plus this process for our ongoing uh, operation and, and maintenance and renewal of the, the network through the, the next control period. OK, thanks for that. If Convener would uh, indulge me, I'd just like to also uh, ask about the, the Cutty Sark uh, Railway bridge replacements, which is in my constituency, and probably also borders on your own, John, as well. Yes, and, mine. and yours as well. No, you've got Try not the, to you've, make it you've, two constituency you've get, you've, get every, you've got everybody here. Um, I'm happy to take the answer to this uh, after committee, but I did want to raise it that the, the bridge works have been delayed several times, um, or at least twice, and um, I know that the residents in the, the local areas have been notified of that, but I was wondering, um, rather than finding out about it, at the same time I'm getting the email and on Twitter, if I could, um, if the, all the elected members um, could get a more detailed response as to why those uh, delays have been in place, rather than just that it's delayed and, and sort of that's it. And as I say, given the, the nature of the committee and the time going, I'm happy to take that uh, yeah. after yeah. committee via email yeah. or Yeah, or I'll, I'll, I, can, I can come out with that detail. Yep. Make sure that the response is actually sent to the clerk so it can go around all of the committee, if, if, if that's possible. Okay. Yep, I'll do that. Um, the next question uh, is John. Thanks, Convener. Uh, I think, Mr Hines, I mean, we've spent most of our time so far on the network rail side, but I'm interested in the, you know, the, the actual trains and the staff and all these kind of things, which we've not spent so much time, and I realise you're quite new to this, so we look forward to getting to know you better. I mean, can you just give us your first impressions of Scott Rail? And um, wh where do you see what's going to be happening in the next year or, or so? What are your hopes and plans? So uh, I've been really impressed by Scot Scot Rail and Scotland's <coughs> Railway in, in general. Um, I had a bit of time between jobs before arriving and I spent a lot of time travelling on the network as a customer without anyone knowing who I was. And, you know, the frequencies, the journey time, the quality of the rolling stock, the investment program, um, the, the staff, the catering, you know, the first class, all of these things benchmark really well against uh, what we see elsewhere in the country. Um, last year we had some operational issues which we've now fixed and one of the key things I will be looking for is can we evidence it through the National Rail Passenger Survey that customers are getting again the service they deserve. So we've got a really solid base on which to build. But then when we're going to transform the company? So I've worked in a number of places where we've introduced new trains and the impact is transformational uh, on customer satisfaction. Um, and that's what we're about to do here. So we are on the cusp of, we've talked today about all the hard work, the heavy lifting, getting the infrastructure and the trains built, but we're on the cusp of actually delivering the customer benefit. And that will, you know, massively enhance the experience of customers across the Scottish network. And we're going to do that because we want happy customers and we want more of them. We want to drive 
the patronage of our railway <coughs> to improve the economics of Scott Rail, as you know, we're in receipt of subsidy. So the more we can drive that revenue line, improve our product, actually it gives us funds which we can use to continually invest in the network. And one of the things that's really impressed me compared to other places I've worked is um, you know, the Scottish Government's commitment to a rolling programme of enhancements. It's almost you know, business as usual, and we've already got a list of the projects that we'd like to see delivered uh, in the next control period from 2019. So uh, I, I'm, I'm super impressed. Um, it's a great business. Uh, we're going to make it even better. And you know, there's a bright future for ScotRail. And I mean, do you ever, do you think you're going to anticipate a conflict of interest at all, as has been mentioned? Because, I mean, as I understand it, you're paid and appointed by Network Rail. So if there's a dispute like on timetabling, how do you personally handle that? So, you know, as, as at the start of this committee, people express their interest. So, you know, if at any point there's a conflict of interest, we would have to take the decision making outside of the alliance. But, you know, I'm trusted by Abellio and Network Rail to be accountable for the delivery of Network Rail's outputs in Scotland and uh, the, the benefits that are being delivered through the franchise. And uh, uh, if that was ever in doubt, um, I would make sure that we never got into that situation. So when you say taking something outside the alliance, I mean, does that mean that you personally wouldn't be involved and that somebody else in Scott Rail and somebody else in Network Rail would kind of end up well, disputing? I mean, clearly, you know, Abellio Scott Rail is part of the Abellio Group. Network Rail Scotland is part of Network Rail. So one opportunity, if a conflict of interest was ever to arise, and there hasn't been one yet, albeit only 10 days in, would be to elevate the decision outside of the alliance. So, you know, these arrangements are not unusual in, you know, partnerships or joint ventures elsewhere. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> I have to ask a question before I pass on to Richard Lyle. Did you, did you, did you go up to Wick and Thursday? <laughs> no, sa sadly, I only made it as far as Inverness. Well, okay, um, I'm going to pass on to Richard because I get into awful trouble for doing a constituency question, but, but say you might like to do that. Richard. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, gentlemen, can I, uh, what John Mason asked uh, actually fits quite nicely into what I'm going to ask. Scott Rail performance. As a customer, I think your trains are, are excellent. Uh, and it, I look forward to going on trains, um, but I want a seat. I think you should have, I know you've got many more trains coming or carriages coming. You need to improve the number of um, you know, carriages that are on a, a particular uh, area. I want to arrive in time and I don't want a station skip, right, or station hop, whatever you call it. Mm. But you've got all these, you've got public performance measures, cancellation, significant lateness, period, moving annual, that's a new one, moving annual average. Um, Scott, Scott Rail, but can I also say, and sorry, Mark, you're going to uh, not be too, too tough when I, I say, uh, would you agree that the Network Rail was responsible for over half of all Scott Rail delay minutes during the previous period in last year? I'm looking at a particular graph. My view is, Mark, you've got the track, Alex got the trains, if he can't use the rail, then he can't move his trains. Yeah. Can I, can I just address that, Alex? I'm sure you want to add to this as well, because I, I want to address this point uh, very directly. Um, you use the word responsible. Actually, the, 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 the correct term is attributed. So the delays are attributed to Network Rail uh, as opposed to the train operating company. And the reason for that is that all, for example, all delays associated with bad weather are attributed to Network Rail. All delays associated with trespass people choosing to walk on the railway and stop the trains are attributed to network rail. All delays associated with uh, the tragic fatalities when people choose to take their lives on our railways are attributed to network rail. So actually the number of delays that are caused by a, a direct failing of network rail's infrastructure are about 20% of the total delays. Now this doesn't mean that we're not that we don't have to do more as a company to reduce the incidence of those other forms of delays because we can reduce the incidence of those other delays. And if I take um, fatalities, which is really one of the most tragic 
um, uh, situations on our railway and that our amazing staff uh, have, to, have to deal with. Um, we've reduced across the, um, uh, the UK as a whole uh, the incident of uh, railway suicides by 16% in the last uh, two years against a rising tide of suicides in the country as a whole. So, uh, so we, can, we can do things to in, in, uh, improve um, uh, the train performance in those areas where our, our, our influence is, um, is somewhat more rem remote, uh, and, we, and we take those very seriously. Right, <clears throat> and I take on board that, but the most recent ScotRail PPM MAA yeah. was 90.3%, Yes, just above the level to trigger an hour improvement plan. So what are you both, you both going to do to ensure that performance does not drop below this level again? So, on that first, if I may. I think there is a little bit of understand, misunderstanding around... Um, you know, the alliance structure. So um, it's not the case that I've got the trains and Mark's got the track. I've got the trains and the track. So you both play and, together then? And we, and we manage it as that, OK? So in a traditional train operating company structure, the managing director of the train operating company would worry about his targets or her targets and, and delays, and Network Rail would be separate. In this structure, David is in my team. So we manage all the delays to customers irrespective of where they happen because frankly customers don't care what causes delays they just want trains to run on time so i'm pleased to say that the moving annual average we measure train series performance using an annual average because train series performance is is seasonal is now at 90.4 we're where we need to be around the improvement plan and in, in answer to your question, we're going to make it better by having improvement plans which cover all parts of our business. So fleet, operations, stations, infrastructure, suicide, trespass. We attack every bit of the pie. Um, you talked about seats. So clearly, um, working with the engineers to make sure we've got the right number of trains each day is a critical task. My train home last night, normally six car, it was a three. You know, that ruined my journey home. And I personally feel that. So not only do Did we measure at the corporate level, but we, you know, the, 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 you know, essentially our customers' requirements are actually quite simple. They just want it to work. Yeah. Is it clean? Is it on time? And can I have a seat? Yeah. And those things are going to be transformed in the next few months and years. So at the moment, if you take Edinburgh to Glasgow, for example, we're operating six-car diesel trains. They will be eight-car brand new electric trains um, you talked about skip stopping so um, a railway will always use always use skip stopping in order to bring the service back to a timetable otherwise it runs late all day so the question is are we using it in uh, the right places at the right times at the right frequencies and that's about the policies that mark uh, set out which our control center works too so i agree with you i think the service is excellent and it's going to get better yeah i i, I think it will I, I i'm i'm the same as you i'm excited about what you're doing but again i'll come back and sorry this is not that's the last question to be there scott rail's right time mma is 8.6 percent below the GB average coming 18th, 18th out of 24 operators. Why is that? So one of the reasons for that is the measure which is in the contract, which is our focus, is around PPM failures. So that is our overriding objective from a punctuality perspective. So that means trains no later than five minutes and, and the train run. So that, that is our total laser beam focus. Now, where I used to come from uh, at Northern, we focused heavily on, on time um, to great effect. And once we've got some confidence around our ability to deliver the, the, the contractual commitment we've made to the Scottish Government around PPM failures, then we can uh, see whether we can uh, plan and operate the timetable to a higher level of precision, this time to the nearest minute, 
But right now, <coughs> it's PPM failures which are our focus, because that's what we're contractually obliged to deliver. Okay, now, can I thank you, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, you've got a supplementary to that. Yes, I'd just like to ask, really, it's very interested in Mark's response to the question about um, um, delays being attributed to, to network mm. rail, <clears throat> because that's what the Transport Minister is telling us, that that's why he wants to take control, if you like, of the network rail in Scotland, because he feels that he can do something about that. But what you're saying is, actually, those are attributed to things like bad weather yep. and other issues, so that, that can't be the reason why he would want to take control of network rail's responsibilities in north of the border, would it? Well, I, I'm clearly not, not able to speak for the Minister. I'm just trying to make sure that you understand the Well, that's the, the, the point facts. I was asking. It, um, yeah, so it is, it, is, it, is the, it is a difference between attribution and real responsibility, yeah. and that's what I think... It, um, and, and there's a reason for it, by the way. I mean, the, and the clear reason why we, do, we choose to do it this way is because um, you wouldn't want the train operating companies as private companies to take those risks mm -hmm. on their balance sheet that they can't really manage. They can't really manage weather risk and suicide risk and trespass risk. So if you ask them to take that risk, you know, they'll take it. Well, I found that's very helpful. But, but they'll pay for it. You'll pay yeah. for it. That's why um, it's carried by the national part of the, um, of the railway. I understand that entirely, and that's very helpful for making, making that clear. Uh, My last Mike, question. hold on. Sorry, Peter wanted to come in very briefly, I think, and then you're going to get the last question. Yes, I mean, uh, we've heard how you're, you're attempting to do the, the job as well as you possibly can, and that's for sure. But I'm looking at the front page of the Press and Journal on Monday, the June the 12th, which is the headline is half of Northeast trains running late. Now, that's it's a particularly tough figure because that's within a minute of when they're supposed to arrive. So I accept that that's fairly tough, but only 50% of trains in Dice, Inverurie, and Stonehaven were arriving on time in that measure. If you take the PPM measure, it's obviously a bit better, but still they are poor. The numbers within PPM at Dice are only 88%, Inverurie 87%, Stonehaven 85% and Aberdeen only 86.8% arriving on time. Now that is below where we expect to be. Um, so I would welcome your comments on how we can improve that, that, these figures. Alex, I, I'm going to allow you a, a very brief answer, if yeah. I may, because we're trying to look so, at a global picture rather than yeah. too local. So, so with performance improvement, we want there to be a rising tide. We need to get better everywhere, and we track uh, performance by route and worst performing trains to make sure that we're giving our customers a good service across the network. There are some structural reasons why it's difficult to deliver very high levels of punctuality on uh, more remote parts of the network, for example, single line sections. But this is why the improvement programme is so important because we can address some of those uh, inherent characteristics which make running a railway difficult and we can deliver a modern railway rather than a Victorian one. Okay. I'm going to allow the, the <laughs> final question to Mike. Mr. Convener, I know the committee is interested to find out. Um, um, this question is about the, uh, pro what proportion of season ticket holders have taken advantage of the free week uh, of travel? And um, if, if, got real good, if you could tell us that. So what's the take-up being like? And also, therefore, um, depending on your answer, of course, what are you doing to increase that? if it's not the level that we thought it might be at. So um, I don't have the latest statistics to hand. The uptake has been very good. We're, we're promoting it across uh, the network on trains and on stations. And we're also using it as an opportunity to promote the smart card because we've talked a lot mm -hmm. about uh, steel and metal and trains today. Mm -hmm. But actually, we're one of the only networks in Britain which is going to have its own smart card uh, which is fantastic for customers. It means that tickets work through barriers. We can start to provide products which are relevant to today's travelling public. Mm -hmm. So, for example, working mothers who don't work every day, they might work three or four times a week. We're now providing flexi passes which are delivering you know, modern fares mm -hmm. and ticketing products for how actually our customers want to use our network. So I'm happy to provide the committee with an update with the latest data after this session. That'd be great. Th thank you, and, uh, and that would be very helpful. Could I just say that that concludes our session. Mark, I'd like to thank you. Uh, 
uh, for coming up. It's been very interesting. Alex, I, I suspect, and David, we'll see more of you during the, the, the course of, of this parliament. But thank you all for giving your evidence to the committee. It's been very helpful. And I'd now like to briefly suspend the, the meeting to allow you to leave. And move into, pri we, sorry, I should say, we, and we are then going to, as a committee, to move into private session.